National Strategic Studies, PRISM, and the National War College. Uh, we welcome you to uh, the second in a series of sessions on the emerging international order. We all seem to re recognize that tectonic shifts are underway affecting national security, and we're all trying to get our arms around those changes. The National Security Strategy of 2017 and the National Defense Strategy of 2018 tried to track those changes, but with the advent of COVID-19, even these same, even they seem uh, overtaken by events. Despite these major shifts in the global balance of power, and even in the way that power is exercised, it's still quite common to prioritize military strength, which has been always seen as the primary currency for achieving national security. With China and Russia flexing in a variety of ways other than military power, with transnational threats like international terrorism and transnational organized crime, not to mention pandemic diseases or climate change, it seems imperative that we re-examine our understanding of national security and what roles the armed forces might have to assume in the future. For any of you unfamiliar with PRISM, these are the kinds of questions that the journal examines. Public, having been published for 10 years, PRISM now has a quarterly print run of 10,000 with recipients in 83 countries. Its goal is to educate joint warfighters and other national and international security leaders in critical thinking in order to achieve security. To help us with that today is Dr. Joseph Stiglitz, professor at Columbia University, former chief economist at the World Bank, Nobel laureate in economics, and a man considered among influential uh, global thought leaders. For anyone not sufficiently impressed, his 50-page CV is available on his website. So Dr. Stiglitz has agreed to speak for 40 to 50 minutes, followed by questions uh, and discussion, and we will wrap up uh, at about 3.30. So just before he begins, any of you that are connected via VPN, if you could disconnect from VPN and access via the regular internet, that will help minimize technical interference. Your microphones and video have been disabled for the session. So please submit any questions you might have for Dr. Stiglitz directly to Kira McFadden through the Blackboard chat function located in the pullout menu on the right hand side of your screen. When submitting questions, we'd be grateful if you would include your name and affiliation. The seminar is recorded and it will be uh, posted later uh, shortly on an NDU website. With that as a scene setter, uh, Dr. Stiglitz, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, over to you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I want to talk about the uh, tectonic shifts in global economics and how they impact uh, U.S. national security, uh, recognizing that we depend uh, on our uh, defense establishment for the protection of our national security. Uh, perhaps as a way of background, uh, let me say a little bit about myself. I was on the National uh, Security Council, the NSC, in the Clinton administration. Uh, I was particularly engaged in several aspects of national security, including nuclear proliferation uh, in the uh, initiative of what was called swords to plowshares, so the conversion of Russian nuclear warheads into the nuclear energy uh, involved with Russia, Ukraine, uh, and the aftermath uh, of the fall of the uh, uh, Iron Curtain, uh, where some of my strong personal connections going back 30 years <coughs> with, class, with classmates in college and graduate school with the Secretary of Defense and the Director of CIA enabled the Council of Economic Advisors, of which I was a member, then chairman, to take a more proactive role in the issues that might normally have been the case. I've also been deeply involved with the issues of sanctions, with technology export restraints, with our China policy, where I've been involved since 1980 in the transition to the market, their transition to the market economy. So I want to begin by emphasizing that there are many dimensions to security. I think it was right that the Office of Pandemics 
should have been should be in the National Security Council, uh, which is where it was. Uh, the pandemic has undermined the economic resources available to defend our country uh, as much as uh, uh, any cybersecurity attack. Um, I can talk tell you from talking to senior government officials, including prime ministers, cabinet ministers around the world, that our failures in managing the pandemic have greatly undermined the standing of the United States. Uh, the pandemic has also shown another aspect uh, of uh, national security, the importance of uh, soft power, something that Joe Nye, some of you may know his work, has emphasized. Um, our success is based on support from others and influence is based on respect. We're a rich country with enormous resources, but we need the cooperation of others. <clears throat> That's crucial for our security. The question is how we get that cooperation. Part of that is trust. When we withdraw from an international agreement without reason that others see as valid, that undermines trust. When we don't honor our word, that undermines trust. Globally, part of America is seen as living in an alternative reality, an alternative view of the world to that shared by a very large fraction of the free world, though sometimes shared by some authoritarian governments. The realization of that has undermined trust in the United States. To what extent will our actions reflect this alternative view of reality? When we don't seem to be acting cooperatively, but unilaterally, that too undermines trust in our soft power. And in that sense, it undermines our security. I want to talk mostly today about geoeconomics and the role of economic policy in economic security and economic security in national security. To continue with the theme of trust and soft power, one of the traditional sources of influence in the United States is respect for economic system. That has been eroding. Uh, it, the erosion, you might say, began uh, more re most recently with the 2008 financial crisis. Uh, many countries around the world saw that as uh, evidence that the United States uh, was unable to manage uh, its economy. I think in some ways, even more telling has been the growth of inequality, uh, the uh, stagnation of incomes um, for large fractions of, of, of the country. Uh, the fact that uh, um, at the bottom, uh, incomes today adjusted for inflation are the same as they were some 65 years ago, that the median income of a full-time male worker in the United States is uh, the same level was more than 40 years ago. Uh, the fact that uh, those of limited education uh, in the United States have seen their incomes decline precipitously over the last uh, 20, 30 years, all of these undermine uh, the uh, respect that uh, our country has. Uh, we are not seen as a role model. I'll return to this uh, soft power in our influence with others, both our strong allies and those who we would wish to join our camp in a few minutes. But I want to first emphasize the importance of the strength of our economy uh, the real strength of our economy, not the stock market, which is not a measure of our real strength, uh, and that that underlies our security. It gives us the resources that we need for our defense. Uh, it gives us the resilience we need under times of stress when things are working well. How do we assess how well our economy is doing? Well, that's a question an economist has spent a lot of time talking about recently. Uh, GDP is part of it, but only part, and an increasingly discredited or a limited part. It doesn't, for instance, reflect sustainability. Uh, we could be doing very well at one moment, but if it's not sustainable, we can't uh, persist, uh, and uh, uh, we won't have those the resources that we need over the long term. And there was concern, evidence back. Uh, in the early years of this century, 
that our economy was not sustainable, and it turned out it wasn't. Now, and we had the financial crisis of 2008. Right now, there's a lot of concern about environmental sustainability, social and political sustainability. GDP also doesn't reflect resilience, uh, our ability to respond to a shock. Uh, we've seen the limits uh, of the US economy, the private sector, and, and in some sense, the public sector. Um, for instance, uh, in response to the COVID-19 crisis, we were not able to produce even simple products like masks, uh, let alone more complicated products like tests and uh, ventilators. Uh, so um, we had realized that we become highly dependent on imports. We've always been dependent on imp uh, imports, uh, and that's one of the reasons why it's important to have good relations with our trading partners. Uh, but uh, as an economy, we need resilient global supply chains. And the pandemic has revealed that our supply chains are not uh, actually uh, as resilient as we had thought. And that, of course, is a key part of our security. But because we are living in an interdependent, globalized world, in eroding strong relations with our trading partners, we've eroded national security. Uh, never have our trading relations been more frayed. Again, a theme I'll come back to very briefly. I want to return to the, the first message is how important strength of our domestic economy is to our long-term national security. The health of our economy depends on the health of our citizens. And this is another dimension and in which things have not been going well. Uh, it is uh, interesting uh, that uh, no, oh, excuse me. Uh, it, it is interesting that um, um, that during uh, previous world wars, we became very aware of the lack of uh, health in our citizens. Some of our nutritional programs uh, began when it was realized that those were being brought in, a very large number being brought into the army, uh, into our armed forces, uh, were, were not in good health. Uh, the data for the United States is, quite frankly, very disturbing. Uh, we have among the poorest health, uh, as indicated, for instance, by the shortest life expectancy, which actually has been declining over the last five years, the greatest divides uh, in uh, health between those who are in good stand and very poor uh, than in, in almost any of the other uh, advanced countries. And again, the pandemic has exposed this large uh, uh, We often talk about American exceptionalism, um, but this is an uh, American exceptionalism of a kind that we should not be proud of. And it needn't be that way. We have the best researchers, uh, research. Uh, we are pushing the frontier in medicine. Uh, we have the, the best universities, uh, but we are not delivering. Uh, another related aspect is uh, technology. We are a technological economy. Now, we have a very uh, advanced technological military. And that depends on advances in basic science. We built a knowledge economy, but that too is weakening. Uh, to have a sustained knowledge economy needs investments in science. Today, investments in science represent a smaller percentage of GDP um, and they did uh, decades earlier. Every year, uh, it's been proposed uh, cuts of our science budget of 30% uh, or more. Fortunately, Congress has, has resisted many of those, but the cuts, for instance, in the 
Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, have left us clearly less secure, less prepared for uh, the pandemic. Part of the success in science is investments in science, but it's also based on respect for science. Uh, it's based on a strong education system. Uh, we have the best universities, as I said before, but data show that overall, on average, our education performance is mediocre at best. Uh, we are below some of our competitors, especially in key areas of science. Uh, you can't play games with science. There is no alternative reality. There are no alternative facts. We have to deal uh, with the, the scientific realities as they are. Now, advances in applied technology are based on a competitive marketplace. And a number of our firms are, are at the forefront uh, in this area, and we benefited uh, very greatly from that. But I said, advances are based on a competitive marketplace. And there was a great deal of concern about erosion in the levels of competition in the United States. Monopolies tend to squash opportunities. Uh, strange as it seems, if that view is correct, competition, competition policy itself should be part of national security policy. Um, the um, important thing also is to realize the uh, role of uh, industrial policy. Uh, the Defense Department, DARPA, has played an absolutely essential role in the advancement of technology in the United States. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, internet, even the uh, uh, browser were developed by uh, the US government and, 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 and DARPA played a, a very key role in that. Um, uh, industrial policy uh, is also going to be important in AI and cybersecurity and lots of other areas. And uh, too often we've uh, not taken as proactive role towards industrial policy. There is a, a, a growing bipartisan consensus now on uh, the U.S. Uh, taking a more active role in that kind of uh, industrial policy may not be the right word, but you might call it uh, policies to advance certain technologies, certain sectors uh, of our uh, economy. Uh, while uh, the competitive marketplace is critical, we cannot rely just on the market. We can't leave it uh, to the market. There is one co key controversy that I, I might mention just very briefly, uh, in which uh, there are two uh, very distinct views. In uh, some countries, uh, there is an argument for what are called national champions. Uh, the view that having a large, maybe dominant firm is a good thing. Uh, the other view says more valuable than that is robust competition. Among economists, there is a broad but far from unanimous consensus that competition is more important than having uh, uh, robust, uh, uh, than having national uh, uh, champions. Uh, that a dynamic marketplace will service in the long run better. And that, interestingly, is, is a, a view that uh, uh, has been taken uh, in, uh, for instance, by the uh, Europeans uh, on this issue. Um, in talking about what makes for a strong national economy, I've uh, talked about uh, uh, the importance of sustainability. Uh, I've talked about the importance of re resilience. Uh, I've talked about uh, the importance of having a healthy populace, a well-educated populace, of having industrial policy. Um, I want to uh, end um, uh, by a couple, two other factors. The first is social cohesion. Uh, which is done a belief that the system, uh, our economic and our social political system is fair. Uh, and that can uh, only be true if we have uh, at least a modicum of inequality 
a modicum of equality, which is something that uh, unfortunately um, uh, don't have. Uh, large parts of America have not been participating uh, in the American dream. I think uh, I've argued in one of my books that it's more accurate to say uh, the American dream is really a myth. The life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the education and the income of his parents than in other advanced countries. Um, finally, the strength at home and how others view us depends how we meet the multiple risks we face. I've already talked about our failures in two areas uh, in addressing the pandemic, addressing the 2008 crisis. Uh, today, I think the most important global risk, risk for security in many dimensions, which we can talk about, is climate change. Uh, looking at both, uh, more narrowly from the point of the United States, in one year alone, recent year, we lost almost 2% of GDP to climate-related events. Right now, we're uh, witnessing the effects of California wildfires and Iowa storms. Um, the lack of climate policy is foolish and is seen that way almost universally outside the United States, and I think by a majority within the United States. Uh, the contrast uh, uh, between what is going on here and elsewhere, this week New Zealand became the first country to mandate the disclosure of a climate risk by their firms. Um, so uh, how we manage risks is an essential part of uh, our national security. So, so far, what I've done is emphasize the importance of economic strength at home. But the central theme of my talk is geoeconomics. Um, and that's also focused on our strength, but more in a global way, our support from our allies, our influence of over others, including our, our vulnerabilities. Uh, I already mentioned uh, that uh, we live in a global economy in which we are very dependent on others, that what we saw so clearly uh, in the pandemic that our economic system is not resilient. Uh, I sometimes describe, explain resilience by talking about uh, cars without spare tires. Uh, uh, you can save a little bit of money in the uh, short run, but if you don't have the spare tire when you have a flat tire and you're 200 miles from the nearest station, uh, you're in a, uh, a very bad fix. And in some ways, short-sightedness, the same kind of short-sightedness that led to the 2008 financial crisis has led our overall economic system to be not as resilient as we would have liked. Um, of course, we will always be somewhat dependent on others. Uh, and that makes assessing uh, fragility uh, a, a very big challenge. It depends on the diversification of our supply chains, the reliability uh, of our partners in global supply chains. Uh, it depends on uh, reciprocal trust. Um, if we are untrustworthy, we act in a way that seems hostile or unreliable, we cannot expect others uh, to trust uh, us. Uh, in an earlier day in talking about geoeconomics, we would have talked about the importance of energy, fuel, so fuel, coal, and particularly oil. It's still important. Germany, I believe, has undermined its security by its reliance on Russian gas. Um, if uh, there's a cutoff of, of gas, uh, it, it, has, it, it doesn't have a second easy source to make up for that. Um, today, I think it's an important part of national security that we need a closer assessment of our sources of fragility, our lack of resilience, and what we can do about that. Uh, that has not really been done so far. Uh, if we think about uh, uh, China, for instance, right now, it is dependent on U.S. advanced chips, but that may end soon. U.S., on the other end, is dependent on the assembly of those chips in China. How 
quickly could we change uh, if that got cut off? Uh, what would that imply uh, for our economy? All of this needs careful calculation. Uh, when we asserted that we need a tariff for autos for national security purposes, we totally undermined our cred credibility. It's interesting that some other countries have begun this process and begun uh, a process of thinking what government can do to uh, enhance uh, that kind of resilience and uh, insulate the country from uh, uh, in response to this uh, changing geo uh, geoeconomics. A chip has actually begun uh, 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 announced at least it, it's beginning to do that. Uh, there's a second dimension of security and geoeconomics, geopolitics that I want to talk about. Failed stakes are a threat to our security. The more stakes that we see that see themselves as allied to us, the stronger is our security. We have neglected Africa and most of the developing world. Worse, in many instances, we have taken them for granted, in many cases avoided them, encouraged the exploitation of them by our financial firms and companies. Uh, there have been scandals like 1MDB in Malaysia, which have undermined in a very strong way US soft power. Uh, as a percentage of GDP, we are among the poor performing advanced countries in providing assistance. Uh, our support for infrastructure in Africa is dwarfed by investment of, uh, uh, infrastructure investments uh, in the continent by China, especially since its Belt and Road Initiative and the Asia Infrastructure Bank. Um, we told countries to turn down the assistance that they were receiving from China, but we didn't offer any alternative. Now, I've seen uh, firsthand the impact of this infrastructure, how it's transformed. Uh, parts of Africa, for instance, in Ethiopia. Uh, it's a crucial country for our national security in the Horn of Africa. Uh, China went in not because of natural resources. Uh, Ethiopia doesn't have much of that, but simply because it had a long-term vision. It believed that, that influence was important. Well, even as China's initiatives were seen with more skeptical, uh, are, are being seen with more skeptical eyes, a result of corruption, of harsh terms, as evidenced by what's happening in Sri Lanka. Um, the firms from the West have also been seen as problematic. Um, in recent recent uh, net debt negotiations uh, with, uh, say, Argentina and Ecuador, uh, companies, um, our Wall Street companies. Uh, Western lenders um, have uh, acted in extraordinarily uh, harsh ways, uh, ignoring the devastating effects uh, of the pandemic. And in many ways, what we do in our financial policy, our economic policies towards others, does undermine our soft power and our national security. For instance, one of the things that is very disappointing to me is the U.S. effectively vetoed the issuance of what are called special drawing rights, SDRs, by the IMF that would have provided hundreds of billions of dollars of pandemic assistance to uh, the emerging markets and developing countries, money that would have not cost us essentially anything. And, and yet we vetoed uh, that initiative. Um, we need a longer term vision of cooperation and influence, not a transactional view of what is in it for us now in the short run. Um, an example of that kind of short run uh, action, which is engendering, uh, undermining our soft, our soft power, is uh, America's vaccine nationalism. Uh, whether uh, it will uh, uh, actually serve our purpose uh, in the short run or not is a question uh, that's under some debate. But what is very clear is that the rhetoric of vaccine nationalism, what we've been doing to try to uh, protect uh, ourselves, 
is losing us friends around the world. So in the last few minutes, uh, I want to uh, turn to four specific questions that have been posed to me, and uh, hopefully the, these introductory remarks will, will give you uh, a, a frame in which to think about, uh, uh, see how I'm answering these questions. Uh, the first was, how do the tectonic shifts in global economics impact U.S. national security? Uh, I want to begin in, answer, in answering that question by an important fact. Uh, we have to realize that we are not, we are no longer the dominant country in the world that we were after World War II. In fact, in 2015, in the standard way that economists measure the relative size of an economy, uh, which is called PPP, purchasing power parity, uh, which uh, takes a, accounts for the real purchasing power rather than the uh, the vicissitudes of, of uh, exchange rate, China in 2015 became larger than the United States. And uh, while our economy is going to uh, decrease this year, probably an estimated uh, five, six percent, China's economy is looking like it's going to increase by some three uh, percent. And so the, their economy has continued to grow relative to our economy. Um, so all of this means that uh, we will need even more cooperation with our allies. Uh, and we want to have more countries join to be our allies. Um, we may not even at this point be the do, have a dominant uh, dominance in every branch of science. A particular concern is uh, artificial intelligence, AI, which is uh, uh, enormous power. Uh, a key input into AI is data. China has more data. Uh, its lack of concern about privacy uh, gives it uh, the access to more data. Uh, the answer is not for us to give up on our basic values, our, our importance of privacy. Uh, it's to be smarter and to invest more. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been doing very much public investment in this area at all. The second question is, uh, has globalization been a boon to U.S. national security, or has it made the U.S. more vulnerable? Well. Globalization has been, as I think I've made clear, a two-edged sword. Some of the growth that we've experienced over the four, last 40 years has been due to taking advantage of comparative advantage. Uh, specialization It's led to uh, faster growth than we otherwise would have had. But mismanaged globalization has contributed to a lack of resilience that I talked about earlier. Uh, global supply chains um, uh, that are insufficiently diversified. It's also mismanaged globalization has also contributed to inequality, which is undermining social cohesion within the United States and in many of other uh, advanced countries around the world. Uh, we've had mismanaged globalization, which has also undermined our soft power. We managed, um, globalization has been basically managed from some, for certain corporate interests. Um, for instance, uh, access uh, to uh, uh, necessary drugs, um, uh, some of the investment agreements which have impaired the ability to uh, regulate the environment adequately. Um, uh, all of these have really uh, undermined uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, soft power, and uh, I think have have uh, had a deleterious effect on our overall security. The third question is: What is the future of globalization? Will COVID-19 kill globalization? Well, 
from my perspective, COVID-19 has exposed both the importance and the limits of globalization. Uh, it has shown the need for global cooperation. Um, it's it was a big mistake thing to withdraw from the World uh, Health Organization. Uh, uh, it is impossible to address uh, global problems like a pandemic, and a pandemic is a global problem, unless we have global cooperation. Uh, and these multilateral institutions are not perfect, but no, no human institution is perfect. Uh, and when we see deficiencies, we ought to work to improve that. Um, and so uh, it's uh, shown very vividly the need for uh, multilateralism. Um, so uh, COVID-19 has showed the importance of globalization and global cooperation, but it's also shown the vulnerability, as I said before, the lack of resilience. Um, and expose the weaknesses in the United States that are associated with the huge inequalities that we have. So my hope is we, the lesson of COVID-19 will, that will move towards a better managed globalization, uh, a better uh, managed uh, uh, multilateral institution that will enhance our security. The final question is, is decoupling possible? Is it desirable? And I think uh, the issue here that's particularly salient is decoupling between the United States and China. Uh, the, the tensions are, are palpable. Uh, the, um, if the United States really does stand for democracy and concern about human rights, it's hard for us to ignore what's happening uh, in Hong Kong, what's happening with the Uyghurs. And uh, uh, there is a, a broad uh, uh, sense that uh, if uh, things continue as they are, uh, there will be uh, um, some degree of delinking, decoupling. Uh, it's not an on-off switch, but it will occur. And uh, but we need to be very strategic and very thoughtful about how manage the process, why we are decoupling, why are we delinking? It's not, you know, you know, the first order effects are not whether China opens up its markets to U.S. insurance companies or financial uh, firms or even uh, some of the uh, trade uh, issues. I think the big, the bigger issues have to do with our value systems, with democracy, with human rights, um, with authoritarian, authoritarianism. Uh, we need to recognize it's not a zero-sum game, and anybody who views international relations, economic, international economic relations, uh, through a zero-sum lens uh, is going to be uh, be very badly misguided. Um, in fact, uh, there is going to uh, uh, need to uh, cooperate to solve global uh, problems, problems like the pandemic, global warming. Um, yet uh, we have to recognize uh, there are fundamental differences, as I mentioned, over democracy. So I believe we can decouple. I think we, we have to be prepared to uh, engage in a, a process of delinking. We have to be aware of the cost. It's going to have implications for our standard of living. Uh, there are, you know, the reasons why we got coupled were basic economics of comparative advantage. But uh, the uh, uh, we can, I think, manage the process of uh, delinkage. So, in conclusion, let me uh, stress. Uh, the central themes uh, that I talked about uh, this afternoon. The first is that national security is much more than defense. It begins with the strengths at home, of our economy and the health of our people, of our research institutions, uh, our ability to meet the risks at home. But it requires cooperation with others, especially as our role, as our size, 
our dominance in the global economy diminishes. This will requiring, require managing globalization. This will require, for instance, a more diversified supply chain and very careful assessment of our resilience and our fragility. It entails the exercise of our soft power. And that begins with respect for the United States. And that depends on our behavior, both at home and abroad. But it includes how we cooperate with others and our trustworthiness. So uh, it, it also includes investments in foreign assistance abroad and many elements of a foreign economic policy. Well, I've tried in these few minutes to paint a, a, a very broad canvas, and uh, I welcome uh, your questions to try to get uh, a little bit more into detail uh, on some of the specifics uh, of what I talked about uh, this afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Stiglitz, um, for that tour de raison. In fact, we have pages of questions, so um, I hope you're ready. Let me just begin with the, the first question is, um, how does our rapidly growing national debt impact U.S. national security? That coming from the Eisenhower School. Yeah. Um, I'm not that worried about uh, debt. Uh, let me put it both over the long run and then the special problems of the increase in the debt since the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, for the most part, not completely, but for the most part, this is money we owe to ourselves. And so uh, the benefits that we get when we borrow money to invest uh, in our economy and our people and uh, in uh, infrastructure and in science uh, yields returns that uh, are far greater than the liabilities and, and uh, easily uh, we can service that uh, service that debt. We can particularly easily service that debt today when the interest rates are close to zero. So um, you know any firm you would look at the balance sheet, you would look at the assets on one side of the balance sheet and the liabilities on the other. And uh, the debt is the liability side. And if the liability goes up, but the assets go up in tandem in a, uh, uh, with high return assets, then we're a stronger economy. Now, the, since the beginning of the pandemic, our national debt has grown very quickly in an unprecedented way. The, the debt GDP ratio this year will be somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. I mean, this has historically never happened uh, before outside of time of war. But uh, most of that debt is being effectively uh, held by the Federal Reserve. And that's a peculiar kind of debt because the Federal Reserve is really part of the U.S. government. So we are borrowing from the U.S. government. Uh, so. Uh, in many countries, uh, we make a big distinction between the gross and the net debt. Uh, and uh, a lot of people talk about, you know, Japan having a huge debt, uh, over 200% of GDP. But half of that debt is held by uh, the Bank of Japan. And so the net debt is much, much less. So uh, right now, the first order is getting our economy, uh, keeping our economy working and then getting it back to normal. And if in that process we have to undertake some debt, uh, we will. Um, that's less important than, uh, less worrisome than not doing anything. So in my mind, unambiguous, we should t undertake more debt to manage the pandemic uh, we have to think about afterwards uh, how to manage that debt, but uh, there are well-established ways of handling it. Thank you, sir. Um, two questions related to the Belt and Road Initiative. The first coming from CISA student Begshad Suleimanov. 
asking if you can speculate on the negative consequences of China's Belt and Road Initiative to Central Asian states, and what measures should those states take to avoid those negative consequences? Well, th there are um, three, at least three uh, concerns that I have. Um, the first is that some of the initiatives uh, of the Belt and Road are not high productivity initiatives. Uh, the country is undertaking debt, but not getting productive assets. So this actually is parallel to the answer of the previous question. If you undertake debt and you make good investments and uh, with returns well in excess of the interest you have to pay, it's a good investment. Uh, but uh, some of the debt that uh, is being undertaken in the BRI uh, uh, initiative are not good investments. So the first advice is be very careful what you use the money for. And what, what, uh, the second related is in some of the projects, there's been a high level of corruption, um, lack of transparency, um, country that I was uh, 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 followed closely, um, the, the, the debt was, uh, um, the, 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 they had the debt and they started looking at where were the assets corresponding and they weren't there. Uh, uh, the, 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 um, the, a lot of the money went, uh, not to make the real investments, but, uh, got siphoned off. So obviously if there's this kind of corruption, whether it's to uh, in the private public sector, uh, uh, you're going to be more, uh, poorly off. So you need transparency. Um, there needs to be uh, uh, where you have democracy, legislate, the parliaments have to be involved in making sure uh, where the money is going. Finally, uh, even good loans can turn sour when economic circumstances change. Uh, the pandemic has illustrated that. Even countries that were not overly indebted have turned out to be overly indebted. Nobody could have anticipated the magnitude of the economic downturn associated with the pandemic. They can, uh, um, and so the question is, what happens when you wind up overly indebted? And uh, there is a great, the Sri Lanka example I mentioned very briefly in my talk illustrates the dangers um, that uh, in the case of Sri Lanka, China took over uh, one of the two ports of the country. And uh, you don't want to lose uh, key assets. Uh, you need uh, an agreement for debt restructuring. And right now there's no global framework for debt restructuring. And some concern that even when the G20 agreed that the, because of the pandemic, the official sector, that is to say government lending, would have a stay on servicing debt. Uh, China claimed that its Export-Import Bank was not part of the official sector it was not a government institution it was a private as if it were a private institution so I think one needs uh, because of the ambiguity of what is public and private I think there needs to be a clear um, framework of what happens if the country winds up not paying uh, a debt and making sure that um, this basic principles that were established by the UN uh, clarified by the UN in 2015 that talk about uh, the importance of uh, uh, sovereign immunity, the importance of uh, uh, having funds for uh, uh, basic uh, needs of the country, uh, trumping uh, debt obligations abroad. Thank you, sir. A related question on the Belt and Road Initiative from the Institute for National Strategic Studies. Question is, how can the United States compete for influence with the Belt and Road Initiative? Well, I think the answer is we need to have a 
more expansive uh, foreign assistance program. Uh, that's what I was quite explicit about. Uh, I'm actually very strongly, you may have uh, seen by now, I'm, I'm very strongly believe in multilateral institutions. I think they help leverage what we do. Uh, we, uh, you might say I'm a little prejudiced because I did serve as chief economist of the World Bank. I was very critical in some ways of what, uh, what it did, um, but um, I worked to try to improve it. I think uh, it's a, uh, uh, the IMF uh, and the multilateral institutions are better th uh, today than they were uh, 25 years ago. So, um, and they, you know, you, you watch what the IMF has been doing uh, in helping countries in the midst of the pandemic has been really impressive. What I would say is very strongly, we need to realize how important uh, 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 foreign assistance is as part of our national security. And uh, uh, it has to be well designed, obviously. Uh, it has to uh, um, uh, be, you know, uh, thoroughly thought through. Uh, some kinds of assistance uh, are more effective than others, um, and uh, but but I think the real answer is uh, we have to uh, support that. Now I also think that good trade policy can help, but as I emphasized in my talk, much of what we've been doing in our trade policy has been a corporate agenda that advances the special interest of a number of corporate. Uh, uh, interest, not our national interest. And so we have to reorient our, our trade policies to reflect our national interest, not corporate interest. Thank you, sir. Uh, from Frank Hoffman on the INSS faculty, Dr. Stiglitz, based on your experience in Washington, do you believe that our current national security structure, uh, the NSC structure specifically, adequately integrates international and domestic economic and issues in the formulation and implementation of long-term U.S. national security? No. <laughs> uh, I, I really do think that, you know, I, I uh, was uh, the one economist on the national security, NSC, when I, and, and I thought uh, there were uh, many uh, more dimensions to economics that you know needed to be reflected in NSC policies. So um, and um, you know when I was on, uh, there were uh, a lot of tension between uh, Treasury and State on policies towards uh, uh, the former Soviet Union uh, um, and. Uh, uh, the that illustrates one of the concerns uh, that I just expressed a minute ago. Um, Treasury tended to reflect Wall Street's view, and um, State Department was trying to reflect a broader national interest view. I, I, I want to say that Defense Department was actually very good um, in the beginning. Uh, 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 Les Aspen was the Secretary of, uh, of Defense, and uh, he was a classmate of mine at MIT uh, in uh, getting a PhD. Uh, and so he, 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 he was very well aware of, of economic concerns, but he was unusual uh, that, to have somebody who was the, that good of an economist as Secretary uh, of Defense. But he was succeeded by uh, Perry, who was also very good. Um, but what I want to uh, emphasize is that uh, uh, there were many issues where more economic analysis would have, I think, broadened our national security. And let me just give you uh, two examples where I, I think, uh, uh, from my experience, uh, uh, having the voice of economists uh, louder, uh, uh, one of them was on um, the issue of nuclear prolifer 
proliferation and the incentives involved in um, the privatization um, USIC, uh, the U.S. Enrichment Corporation, the risks that were uh, um, engendered by having a, a, a private American company be the recipient of uh, the de-enriched uh, uh, uranium from uh, Ukraine and Russia's nuclear warheads, uh, from Ukraine's nuclear warheads. Uh, I think that was a mistake. Um, and uh, China policy, uh, obviously, uh, uh, um, uh, the uh, economics is ex at the center of the China policy, but it was also a national security issue. So uh, I think we need that there needs to be a, a, a larger voice of uh, economics in Annecy. Great, thanks. Um, two questions on. First, coming from Colonel Mohammed of the College for International Security Affairs. Dr. Stiglitz, in your opinion, mid and long term impacts of the U.S. from the TTIP and the TTP on the U.S. economy on, and on U.S. security? Um, well, I, the TPP, for instance, let me talk about that because uh, uh, that was well. Uh, Further formulated uh, at the time we reduced uh, withdrew from TPP, um, the um, it shows both sides. Uh, we Obama spoke very forcefully about the importance of TPP for bringing countries in Asia uh, within a stronger uh, orbit of the United States. Uh, so uh, that intention was, uh, I think, uh, correct. But it made two critical mistakes. It had a, in the tone in which it was set, uh, it had a tone of American colonialism as opposed to cooperation. Uh, in one of his State of the Union speeches, uh, President Obama said, who is going to be writing the rules for Asia? Will it be the United States or China? Well, obviously, if you're talking about who's writing the rules for trade in Asia in the 21st century, you have to think of that being Asians. We, 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 we would work with them, but the idea that we, you know, you have to remember that when we say something, other people listen to the words we use. And if we say uh, we are writing the rules for Asia, that's not going to be well received. So you, you, you have to pay attention very sensitively to, to, the, to the reality of the 21st century. And that means Asia is going to be writing that, those rules, but we, you, we don't want it to be, it's going to be done cooperatively. And when you do that, you have to realize that many of the rules that we were trying to foist were not good rules for Asia. They were rules that were good for our corporations. And that is reflected, and I said before, that our trade agreements were often um, more a reflection of corporate interests. Uh, a good example of that was the provisions in TPP dealing with health. Um, Access to generic medicines is extraordinarily important for poor countries, important for rich countries too, but for them it's a matter of life and death. So um, there were provisions in that agreement that made access to life-saving medicines more difficult, access to generic medicines more difficult. And uh, interesting thing was that in the aftermath of U.S. withdrawing from TPP, the other countries agreed to go ahead with TPP, but they took out these noxious provisions dealing with intellectual property uh, and with drugs in particular. And, uh, you know, th this also speaks a little bit to what I said before about the importance of science and health and listening. Um, I met with all the health negotiators of all the TPP countries 
over this issue about how you write a good agreement that would uh, maintain access to health, uh, generic medicines. Uh, all of the countries, except for one, uh, agreed to talk and engaged in you know a, a good discussion. Now, one country was the United States. So uh, it shows, that, in a sense, the lack of cooperation, that we weren't seeing this as a cooperative uh, uh, enterprise. And uh, I think that when you when you do that, it undermines uh, our soft power. Thank you, sir. Um, related to that question, coming from a European colleague, uh, Karl Lallerstadt from the Confederation of Swedish Industry in Stockholm, asks, how do you see the longer term prospects of reviving the TTIP negotiations or reaching some form of significant trade agreement that would strengthen the transatlantic link? Um, so here, uh, the hardest issue in uh, expanding trade between the United States and Europe are the non-tariff barriers, the regulations. Right now, the uh, tariffs between the United States and Europe uh, on each side are on average 3%. Uh, that's not a big barrier. And you you think about what the fluctuations in exchange rate, they can be 15, 20%, far more than that 3% barrier. So, so the, I don't view the tariffs as a big barrier. The non-tariff barriers can be a significant barrier. The problem is, uh, to a very large extent, the non-tariff barriers represent differences in views of our societies about uh, different uh, values, uh, different uh, concerns of our citizens. So for instance, when it comes to the technology companies, uh, Europe, I think uh, I happen to be on Europe's side, more concerned about privacy than the United States. And so they've devised a whole set of regulations concerning privacy. Uh, in agriculture, uh, Europe is much more concerned about GMO than the United States. Um, and you go down area by area, uh, in many of the non-tariff barriers, there are fundamental differences in values that should trump trade. Now, in the end, I do think that if we can get a trade agreement in which corporate interests understand that uh, the limits, um, that we are not gonna take down all the non-tariff barriers, but there are lots of them that we can take down, then I think we can get a meaningful um, uh, uh, agreement that will expand our integration. And, and that would be a good thing. Thank you, for Professor. Um, on uh, the question of industrial policy, I'm sorry, not industrial policy, on uh, managing globalization, we have a question from Mark Bucknam uh, from the uh, National War College faculty. How does one manage globalization and who should do that managing? Oh, that's a really hard uh, question. Uh, the, the, um, uh, in the end, there are two levels of managing globalization. Uh, the first is the global rules that are set by institutions like the WTO, uh, trade agreements that we've just been talking about, uh, and the, uh, 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 the multilateral institutions uh, that play a very big role in, in uh, 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 managing globalization. And the second one is managing it domestically. So when it comes to managing domestically, what I mean by that is uh, managing some of the consequences of globalization. Uh, if uh, opening of trade leads to some, sec some, some parts of our country uh, s having uh, a loss of jobs, uh, we have to have 
active labor market policies and industrial policies, which can help them get new jobs. Um, you know, it's not one of the basics of, of globalization. In the early days, there was a view that, oh, don't worry about the loss of jobs. New jobs will be created. Well, we know that that doesn't happen automatically. And sometimes the new jobs don't get created as fast as the old jobs get destroyed. So you need active policies to, to manage the adverse effects of globalization. So that's our first responsibility as a country is to manage those adverse effects. But the global architecture, the United States in the past has played a very constructive role has played a key role in, in, in writing those international rules. But unfortunately, quite often those rules have been reflected, as I've said before. And so when I say managing them, managing them from broader international and national perspectives as opposed to corporate uh, interest. And I think part of that uh, will happen the more we democratize the process. The problem is that much of the rulemaking in globalization has been done behind closed doors. Uh, in the case of TPP, uh, even the chair of the finance committee, committee in the Senate initially was told he couldn't get access to what the US uh, bargaining position was in TPP. And of course, he exploded at that point and eventually got it. But the point is that uh, it's been viewed as the purview of the administration done in secret with many people in industry groups having access to the position of the USTR, the US Trade Representative, but people in civil society and even people in Congress not having access and therefore not having it influence. So to me, part of managing globalization better is democratizing the process of managing globalization. Thank you, sir. Um, you, uh, you mentioned before that uh, one of the responses to the, um, to the Belt and Road in, uh, Initiative should be a more robust U.S. assistance program. So I have a question coming from Rob Garverick from the Eisenhower School. Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, you uh, I'm sorry, this is from uh, Melissa Patsalidis of the Eisenhower School. What do you think of the potential of the new U.S. International Development Finance Corporation as an extension of U.S. soft power? Is there a focus it should take in its inaugural decade? Well, I, I think that um, um, the focus of assistance that is going to be successful has to be on what can most help the development of the countries that we're providing assistance to. And what is key in that is that we not project our particular view of the world on ideology. I mean, by that I mean, of course, we believe in market economies. But in the particular uh, mix between the market and the government will differ from different countries. It differs across uh, 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 the countries in Europe, uh, uh, across uh, advanced countries. And we should not take a very narrow view uh, of what we think their development strategy ought to be. So in other words, I think it's uh, very important that not be extensive conditionality, uh, that uh, there should be a much more cooperative stance um, and a much more um, uh, deeper interaction, not just with the government, in the countries, but with the people in the countries, uh, working with civil society, working with uh, uh, NGOs, uh, 
uh, working with a, a variety of kinds of, of, of institutions. So um, the, 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 the basic thing is that uh, um, we shouldn't have too strong of an agenda beyond the agenda of broadly advancing, uh, you might say, democracy, human rights, um, uh, uh, kinds of, of uh, market economy, but a very broad view of what that entails. Thank you, sir. Um, sorry, these are shifting around so much, uh, but it'll keep us young. Uh, this question is from Rob Garverick of the Eisenhower School. Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, you spoke about industrial policy. Beijing introduced Made in China 25 with a focus on high technology and advanced manufacturing. How should we respond? Well, I think uh, that we need to recognize that um, the countries that are behind are inevitably going to try to catch up. Japan really pioneered in the use of industrial policy. I mean, you could say the United States pioneered. We used uh, the uh, U.S. government agricultural extension policy. Uh, it was what uh, closed uh, had enormous impact in increasing productivity in agriculture. We've engaged in industrial policy uh, throughout our, our uh, last 150 years. Uh, but uh, in terms of development, Japan's very successful industrial policy, uh, Korea. So it's not a surprise that China uh, would want uh, to do that. Um, so I don't think our objection should be to their trying to close the knowledge gap between them and us. Uh, that's uh, a reality that we're going to have to realize, and uh, 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 that's, that's going to happen. Uh, their per capita income is about a fourth, a fifth of the United States. That's a huge gap. And, and uh, given access to knowledge that's global, uh, unless we can get global cooperation with Europe, with uh, all the other advanced countries, uh, we have very limited ability to stop their closing that gap. But there are a few areas where where we may want to think more strategically. Um, uh, but that there will be a, a cost of doing that. And so I raise this issue. I, I'm not sure what view I have. I think it's something that really needs a lot of uh, uh, thought. There is a key area is the gap. Uh, they don't have the advanced chips that we do. And uh, uh, those advanced chips are uh, essential to their, their um, uh, AI and uh, uh, many of their uh, other key areas. Now, if we take a strong action and uh, reduce their access to our chips in a significant, those advanced chips in a significant way, uh, there are two questions we have to ask. One of them is, will they get them somewhere else? Can we really enforce a significant uh, reduction? And the second one is it will accelerate their efforts to be in, to, 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 to advance their, uh, their technology, um, which probably on their own, at least most people think, they could do, but it will take them several years. So um, uh, the question is, is that, you know, are the net benefits of doing that uh, worth, uh, worth it? It is something, uh, you know, it, it goes beyond the kinds of measures that we've taken, which have been really uh, uh, very, very limited, like, uh, Huawei, you know, limiting sales of Huawei. What we're talking about is uh, access to chips that we control now. Um, we have the monopoly on them, or at least uh, just uh, on them now. Uh, should we take actions to impede in a significant way their closing the gap? Thank you, sir. Next question coming from 
uh, Phil Saunders of the Institute for National Strategic Studies. To what extent can the U.S. force others to decouple from the Chinese economy? And what are the costs of trying to force them to choose between us? Well, first, let me say that uh, that's why I emphasized over and over again uh, the need for cooperation. Uh, it's a lot better if they see the world in the same way that we see the world. So our interests are aligned and we aren't making them choose between us and them. So uh, that uh, highlights the, one of the main themes of my talk, which has been trust and cooperation, soft power. Uh, I, um, that was, I was at the uh, Munich Security Council uh, conference uh, this year, Mark, uh, uh, last thing before the pandemic closed on uh, the pandemic, uh, the last uh, trip I took. And uh, that was the issue that was being talked uh, about over and over again. Um, and uh, the Europeans were being, at that moment, uh, 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 were feeling very strongly being uh, um, asked to choose between uh, China on the one hand and uh, the United States uh, on the other. Um, obviously, uh, their normal, their 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 affinity is towards democracy, towards the United States. Uh, but their economic interests, say Germany, are very closely still aligned uh, with um, uh, with China. And so I could, you know, conversations I had, you could feel the tension uh, that they felt uh, over over this issue. Uh, I, I do think that um, the more we can explain well why it is that we think decoupling, delinking is important, or the more carefully we tailor the delinking, I say it's not an on-off switch, it's a, it's, a, it's a direction in which things are going to be moved, the more carefully we tailor it uh, and the more uh, uh, we can give rationale for why we are doing it in the way we're doing it, the more likely we are going to be successful. Um, I don't think we want the world, uh, goods and uh, flow so, so extensively that um, uh, it, it will be very difficult. And, uh, for us to force other countries. And uh, I don't think we will, at least in the short run, be able to do it uh, uh, unless we get their cooperation voluntarily. Thank you, sir. Um, a question from Mark Phillips from National Defense University. What impact do you see the emergence of central bank digital currencies, such as the digital yuan having? And do you see the U.S. dollar continuing to be the world reserve currency in the future? Um, yes, I do think the U.S. dollar is going to be the reserve currencies. I think uh, there are two aspects of digitalization. Um, there's going to be a lot of digitalization going on. I mean, in, in a sense, paper money is a little bit arcane in the same way people don't carry around gold bars anymore. They went to paper and uh, paper is uh, becoming arcane. Uh, we're going to have a digital currency. Some countries are very, very digitalized. We would be much more digitalized if we didn't have uh, uh, Monopoly, uh, monopolistic power in the in the financial sector. Uh, other countries have digitalized much more than we have. Uh, uh, countries that have a, a more innovative financial system. So um, I I think that uh, digitalization itself uh, is is not an issue uh, that will affect the U.S. standing as a reserve currency. What is of concern is uh, the non-transparent 
digital currencies like bitcoins. And uh, that undermines uh, um, the functioning uh, of uh, the global fin financial system. You know, for, for 20 years, we've been trying to create a more transparent global financial system. And these uh, cryptocurrencies are moving in exactly the, the wrong way. And I, there are instruments which uh, we can uh, use to circumscribe these cryptocurrencies. And I believe if they grow to any significant extent, we will undertake those instruments. And so that's why I'm not particularly worried about the, even the digital cryptocurrencies. Great, thank you, sir. Um, a question from Jody Vittori, former uh, College of International Security Affairs faculty, now with Transparency International. Uh, Dr. Stiglitz, there's been a good deal of discussion about the role corruption is playing in rating security in two ways. First, how some countries use corruption as a foreign policy tool to undermine U.S. and the West. And second, the role of illicit financial flows in undermining the U.S. economy. Do you think these concerns are valid, and what might the U.S. be doing about these things? Um, yes, I, I, I think they are uh, valid concerns. Um, you know, I, I've been uh, engaged uh, uh, in this uh, fight on corruption for, for a long time. I was the uh, at one critical meeting of the OECD where we uh, uh, discussing corruption. I was a representative of the, of the United States, and uh, it was um, at uh, a, a critical moment with several of our of our allies. Uh, uh, argued that you should uh, uh, wasn't corruption weren't bribes a legitimate business expense and shouldn't they be tax deductible and uh, they were very resistant uh, to to uh, uh, not making them tax deductible let alone uh, banning them I think things have changed since then and uh, England has a stronger Foreign Corrupt Practices Act uh, than the United States. Um, I think that uh, uh, it is important that the United States maintain a strong anti-corruption stance. Uh, it is important uh, that um, uh, uh, we be seen uh, in contrast to some others, as a country that doesn't tolerate corruption. And I can tell you, talking to many American businesses actually think it's a strength uh, because uh, when the government uh, or some other official in another country tries to get a bribe, they can say, look, at, I, you know, I'd love to bribe you if I could, but I'll go to jail for it. And uh, so... And of course, it makes doing business a lot easier if you don't have to give bribes. So it actually is even uh, a good business uh, practice. I I think you know I, I've talked about inequality in the United States uh, and around the world. Um, the tax havens are uh, major uh, vehicles or places. Uh, which contribute to global inequality. Uh, they money gets siphoned off. People aren't paying the taxes they should. Um, not uh, maybe as bad vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States as it is for some other countries. Um, but uh, the Panama Papers uh, uh, and the subsequent investigative journalist uh, reports have made it absolutely clear. Uh, the uh, adverse uh, role that uh, these uh, secrecy havens, because more than tax havens, it's secrecy havens have uh, on our societies. So to me, uh, maintaining pressure on these is very important. Now, one problem the United States has in this is that uh, several of the stakes within the United States have become uh, major secrecy havens. 
uh, major places uh, where uh, uh, bad money hides. And um, that was made very force to me very forcefully by some Swiss bankers who were, of course, furious that we had put a lot of pressure on their role as uh, uh, a secrecy haven, uh, tax avoidance. And they said, well, you know where a lot of the people from Latin America took their accounts when they went uh, out of Switzerland? They went to the United States. So um, the, uh, and real estate has been uh, an even worse way for money laundering. Uh, a lot of money laundering going on through real estate uh, in the United States. So, um, and this is undermining uh, our society and our economy. Thank you, sir. I hope you have time for one last question. We have many sure. more, but uh, I want to be very respectful of your time. And this comes from Colonel J.R. Daimal from the National War College. And it refers back to your uh, your comments on managing globalization. He asks, uh, you, Dr. Stiglitz, you assert that manage, mismanaged globalization has resulted in domestic economic disparity. What policies should we undertake to better manage our engagement with the global economy? Yeah, so this goes back to this issue of inequality um, and I want to make it clear that globalization is not the only and maybe not even the most important force giving rise to inequality. There are others, changes in technology. Deindustrialization would be going on in many parts of the United States just because of the advances in technology. Globally, employment and manufacturing is declining. And so, uh, uh, we would be facing a challenge even in the absence of globalization. But globalization has made it even more difficult. It has contributed uh, to the problem. So um, as a, the, uh, one of the key aspects of, uh, of this is that demand for labor in certain air sectors, in particular manufacturing, and particularly of unskilled workers, has declined. And that has led to lower wages. Uh, uh, a lot of manufacturing jobs 50 years ago were viewed as high paying jobs. We've retained the manufacturing sector, but only by converting it into low paid jobs or not well paid jobs. So the answer in my mind is we're not gonna be able to maintain manufacturing. It'll still be a part of our economy. I don't mean, to, but it's only about nine percent of the employment. Um, the objective should be to help people move to other sectors of the economy, and there are uh, a lot of important you know, growing sectors. Uh, we want to the service sector is the part of the economy that's growing. Uh, some parts of the sectors that will be growing we're going to require people to move from one place to another to get new skills um, uh, solar panels a lot, we're, we're going to need a lot of labor as we go for the green transition um, there are a lot of uh, jobs in the caring sector that we need um, they need to be higher paid um, so overall my, what I said before is we need active labor market policies and industrial policies to help people move from the old sectors to the new sectors and to make sure that the new sectors are well paid, um, productive sectors of our economy. And uh, that should be a natural part of the dynamics of change. Um, you know, mid uh, as we move to the mid uh, 21st century, it's a different economy than the mid 19th, 20th century. And uh, markets don't make these big structural transformations easily well on their own. And uh, there is an important role uh, manage that process 
of transformation. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed this. Great questions. Yep. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, before we adjourn, let me just say, you've been very generous with your time and agile with uh, your responses. And um, I just want to thank National War College for co-sponsoring and the INSS team of uh, Brett Sweeney and Kira McFadden for supporting us. Uh, you have opened our aperture and we're all deeply appreciative. Thank you so much. And to everybody, um, stay safe, stay healthy, stay strong, and stay in touch. Uh, Klausik, over and out. <laughs>